Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Khalil Doheny, and I'm Director of Content Marketing at Digital Niche Agency. Today, we have Richard from uh, Lightning Motorcycles. Richard, how are you doing today? Doing well, thanks. Of course, of course. And Richard, while people are trickling in, do you want to kind of just give a quick background of yourself and what we can expect from today? Recording in progress. 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 Recording in prog
And then Dave Swack uh, was not only a sales manager for a Borg Warner electrification business unit, but Dave was also a successful Formula Atlantic race driver and a test driver for the General Motors Corvette development program. So some of you uh, may recognize some of the people on this page, but let me highlight real quickly uh, the right-hand side, Jamie Heineman, who after his uh, career as a, a star of Mythbusters has focused his skills on a variety of clean technology projects, including helping Lightning Motorcycle. So what has prevented the adoption of electric motorcycles? Why has that adoption lagged behind electric cars? So in, in my view, it really comes down to a few fundamental points. Performance, the price premium, the uh, range limitations, charge limitations, and uh, the limited product uh, uh, segments that are addressed. So what has Lightning done to address these challenges? So we focused on performance and developed competition that we could compete with and win against uh, the best gas race bikes and then bring this technology to consumers. And then our Stripe model series competes not only in performance with the best gas bikes, but also with value. And then range, our top models now have over 170 mile range at 70 miles an hour and can recharge to 80% in 10 minutes. And we have three different models currently that we're bringing to market and additional three uh, models that are in the works. So, you know, how have we been able to do this? So uh, we've really focused on developing our core technologies in-house or Many of the other electric vehicle companies have relied on third-party engineering consultants and their supply chain to develop their core battery, power electronics, motor technology, um, and, and electronics. So by bringing this in-house, this has allowed Lightning to uh, rapidly integrate new technology, attract new technology. And we've taken this path of developing and owning our core IP in-house so that we can bring better products to market quicker. So this really talks about the, the modular architecture. So uh, the battery pack, the vehicle control unit, the battery management system, the drive system, we could scale this down for scooters, uh, which we've done for uh, one of our investors in China and scale it up for uh, very high performance bikes. So by being able to have a, a modular technology, again, we can bring products to market quicker and, and better products. So where are we today? So first of all, we've been uh, delivering the LS218, it's a uh, electric hyperbike with over 240 horse at the rear wheel. This is the production version of the 218, the bike that we set uh, world speed records with and won uh, the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb in Wama. Um, it's a, a very uh, high performance bike that's very easy to ride. And then we have the Strike. Our Strike R not only has great performance, but also delivers performance at a great value compared to other bikes in the segment. This slide covers, uh, you know, some of our customers uh, that use bikes uh, for track riding, for competition, or, or daily rides. So what's next? So one of the new products that we're really excited to introduce is our Lightning Dual Sport. So it has overall geometry and weight similar to a KTM 890 but more power than a 1290 and all the benefits of an electric drive system, the, the smoothness, the quick charge. So we think this is a, a very exciting product. And then we have the Spark, which is really based on uh, a product that Honda brought to market, the Grom. Um, our Spark has 38 horsepower at the rear wheel where the Grom has about 10 at the motor shaft. We have uh, uh, prototypes of the Spark that you could come to our facility and test today. We're continuing to develop it and we're planning on bringing this to market in 2024. So kind of in a summary, 
Lightning uh, is leading in electric motorcycle technology. We have bikes that can charge to 80% in 10 minutes, ride more than 170 miles at 70 miles an hour, and offer unequal performance and rider experience. We've been delivering bikes to, con to consumers. We're ready to scale our production to meet the demand. And the electric motorcycle market is at a, a great uh, point right now because it benefits from the availability of public charging that's continuing to roll out. There's government support around the world for electrification of two-wheel vehicles. And the consumer demand is being driven by exciting new product offerings that offer great experience. So we have a, a great team, very passionate, very experienced, very talented. Um, we're all committed to building electric motorcycles that drive the revolution, provide a better experience than gas motorcycles. So, you know, the webinar uh, is highlighting too, we have an opportunity that we present to people to own a piece of Lightning. We're going to announce a, an exciting exclusive perk program soon. So stay tuned and uh, join us on the ride. Awesome. Thank you, Richard, for that wonderful presentation. And yeah, now we want to answer your any questions that you might have. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the uh, Q&A chat box. Um, Richard, I have a question for you. Why now? Why is this a great opportunity right now? So, you know, the technology is ready. Um, right now, it, it rivals or is better. Um, than, than gas technology as far as the overall experience and performance. Uh, the value is there. And uh, the acceptance of uh, electric cars has provided a charging infrastructure that um, allows you to ride your lightning anywhere in the country and, and charge quickly. And so, you know, in a nutshell, the technology is here, the environment is here. And, uh, you know, it, it's Anyone who gets on a Lightning now uh, and off of a gas bike is going to be uh, pleasantly uh, surprised. And then how much will the charging time be reduced by using a home outlet? So the charge time uh, at, at home is really based on how much power uh, do you have in, in your house that can be allocated to this. So uh, if, if you have... A, a level three charging at home, you could duplicate the same charge time that uh, uh, that we're able to do on a supercharger. But more likely, uh, a lot of homes have a, a 50 amp uh, single phase 240 uh, outlet at home. And uh, with a, a relatively inexpensive charger uh, that uh, provides uh, about 12 kilowatts, so uh, a, a little over an hour and a half. And then tell me about the durability of battery life warranty when you charge 80% in 10 minutes. Is that because of the small power of the battery? Or do you have a proprietary um, lion such as titanate? So there, there's really a lot uh, involved in the fast charging. So uh, performance in general and specifically charging is limited by whatever the bottleneck is in the system. And the first thing that was required, we had to have cells, uh, silicon anode cells that would allow a bike to accept a charge in that rate. Uh, and then we had to work on the system. So basically everything from the conductor to the contactors involved, to the cabling, to the cooling system, all had to be uh, scaled and sized appropriately for that charge rate. So at 80% at, uh, at charge in 10 minutes, um, you can do that, uh, you know, hundreds of times and at uh, 170 miles per charge, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, 17,000 miles before there's a significant reduction in, in the uh, uh, roughly a 20% reduction. But if you're not charging every time at, at that rate, then that can be doubled or tripled. Thank you. And then uh, this is from Paul Compton. Hi, Richard. Long time no speak. Will you be adopting Tesla's NACS as an alternative to CCS1? 
Hey, Paul, glad to hear. Uh, I'm going to turn my audio up for a second. Um, okay. Um, could you repeat that question? Yeah, no worries. The question is, um, will you be adopting Tesla's NACS as an alternative to CCS1? Yeah, we're we're investigating that now. Um, the market seems to be going that direction, and we want to offer that as an option as soon as possible. So it's something that we're currently pursuing. And then I was thinking of buying a legacy midwing, but do you ever anticipate a highway cruising model in the future? Yeah, um, the, the dual sport uh, would be a comfortable bike uh, to cruise on the highway with, um, similar to uh, BMW GS. And we're also looking at other more cruiser type bikes as well. So that is a, that is a direction that we're investigating and where we will go. And then in the future, do you see a partnership with Tesla to use their supercharger network as many car manufacturers are doing? Yes. Uh, so part of adapting the uh, NACS system um, would allow us uh, to work with Tesla and access that system as well. So uh, that again, that is something we're pursuing, something we're interested in, and we think that uh, the market in general is going that direction. And then do you see a future with solid state batteries? Yeah, we actually uh, have some solid state batteries in house currently that we're testing. So again, it's one of the reasons it's really a great time to be uh, in this industry and developing this product um, is we're seeing so much uh, new technology and with uh, our, our ability to integrate it and, and bring it to, to market and test it quickly, uh, it puts us in a, in a great position to you know, to, to stay at the head of that. So we do have uh, solid metal batteries in house that we're testing and it's a, another exciting uh, opportunity. So, and again, uh, we, we've heard some people say, well, you know, setting land speed records and doing racing, that's really a, a vanity pursuit. But what we've found is that's really a great calling card to open the door for new technologies and have, uh, engineers with new, new technologies seek us out to test it and integrate it. So that's uh, where a lot of this comes from. And then what are the plans for dealership? When will buyers be able to buy and get service close to home? By the way, I own a Strike and love it. I'll never go back to ICU powered motorcycles. I, I'm sorry, the audio is... Uh is on my side is not very loud. Can, can, can you speak a little bit louder? I'm having yeah. yeah. Uh what are the plans for dealership? When will buyers be able to buy and get service close to home? By the way, I own a strike and love it. I will never go back to ICU powered motorcycles. So we we will roll out uh, a dealer network in in uh, key geographic areas, but we're also planning on supplementing that in other areas with lightning stores. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you love your strike and, uh, and, and are enjoying it. And then Danny's asking here is how quickly does it charge? Uh, so again, with uh, the lightning fast charge system, if I understand the question correctly, um, it can charge to 80% in 10 minutes. Is, is that the question? Uh, the question just says, how quickly does it charge? Okay. The next question is, can you discuss the advancements in electric motorcycle technology, such as regenerative braking and smart connectivity, connectivity features? Yeah, so uh, on the Lightning, uh, regen, being able to slow down and, and convert that forward momentum into electricity, that energy that's that's restored again in the battery and reused it is part of all of our bikes. That's uh, fairly straightforward to accomplish on, on electric vehicles. Um, so it's it can be set uh, by uh, by the uh, operator, by the user. 
uh, turned up where it's basically a uh, single control. You can accelerate and decelerate and, and stop uh, just with the throttle um, or uh, turn down and, and provide more coasting. So it's something that's totally uh, uh, definable by the user. Um, and then as far as um, as electronics and, and uh, other kind of uh, uh, user apps, uh, it's one of the things our software team is is working on. We have uh, apps now where a lot of the, the uh, parameters can be set on the bike from uh, a smartphone. And again, it's a, a great time to be in this industry virtually. Um, any of this can be integrated into the bike. And then I don't see any IP applications or issued patents. I would like to encourage you to file uh, more cases. I would like to help. This is from Chris Novak. Okay, very good. We will uh, we'll speak with you on that, Chris. And then do you or your team have any past experiences with launching brands in this space? Um, so I guess in, in a uh, we've a lot of us have been very successful in other businesses. None of us have started an electric motorcycle company before, or a motorcycle company. Um, there are you know many things in launching a business that are uh, common from different kinds of businesses, and then certain things that are, are very unique. So, um, no, we have not started an electric motorcycle company before. This is our first one, but we've been. Um, deeply engaged and working on this for quite a few years and uh, and very committed to it. And then what does the future hold for electric motorcycles and how might they shape the future of transportation? Yeah, so that's a great question. So from what we see, you know, the, the batteries are uh, going to, you know, continue to get better and better. Uh, other forms of energy storage are also, um, uh, potentially very exciting. Uh, power electronics, uh, since we've been involved, has uh, become much uh, more powerful, much smaller, much lighter. Uh, the same with uh, motor development. So uh, I, I really don't see a, uh, a limitation in the near future for where this can go. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's a very exciting thing to, to be involved with. And um, you know, it's just going to get better and better. And then are motorcycle platforms better for R&D because of small form factor and manageable components, et cetera, that you can spin more cycles or new prototypes faster than cars? Yeah, so there, there are certain advantages for motorcycle and certain challenges. So for one, you know, a motorcycle is, is smaller, it's lighter, it has less frontal area. Um, you know, it's it, uh, that the regulation structures are different for motorcycles than for cars. So it does allow us to uh, do things quicker. Um, one of the challenges, again, is that they are smaller and a high performance motorcycle has similar power to uh, uh, to many cars. So being able to package all of that on a bike and then keep the weight down, uh, weight is really, really critical on a performance motorcycle. Um, so, you know, packaging size, volume, weight uh, are, are challenging. Um, but uh, when, when you do it right, when you uh, package it correctly, have the right geometry, have the right weight, have the right power, it, it just uh, provides a great experience. And then what are the risk factors? And then how do you mitigate those risks? So uh, risk factors being... Uh, um, business risk, I'm assuming, is what's uh, what's outlined. So, you know, the risk factors are, um, you know, similar to uh, uh, many early stage companies. Uh, you know, the, the legacy companies are, are better funded. Uh, they have better resources, but they're they're also um, limited in some degrees by their structure. Um, so, some companies, you know, a lot of companies could uh, could be working on. Technology, uh, technology could be changing. Um, uh, it, you know, issues of you know having adequate capital and adequate resources to scale and, and hit that inflection point. 
those are all risks, uh, risks that we're very well aware of and that we're working on addressing. And again, it's one of the reasons why our, our modular technology platform, our in-house ability to stay ahead uh, of competitors, we think gives us a, a great advantage to addressing that. And then what is the most successful brand you or your team has launched? And what is a large problem you or your team has solved in the past? Hmm. Well, um, again, we have people that um, have been in a variety of different uh, companies, um, not uh, founders of, of other companies, but people have contributed to the success of other companies. So. Um, And then how does the cost of ownership on an electric motorcycle compare to a traditional gasoline motorcycle over time? So in, in general, you only have uh, in the drive system one moving part uh, in an electric motorcycle. You have a rotor that's spinning on bearings. Um, that rotor, it doesn't have friction. It's not touching anything. So... Uh, uh, one of the drive systems that we have in, in our bike was tested by one of the major automotive companies. And uh, they determined that uh, that motor system, that drive system in a large vehicle, a four-wheel vehicle, could have a life of over seven or 800,000 miles. So in a motorcycle that, you know, it should be extended because the, the load overall was less. So you do have uh, wear components components like tires, uh, you, uh, chains or belts, brakes, although you really, if you set the regen up, you don't use the brakes uh, as much. You use the regen rather than wearing the brakes out. So overall, uh, the cost of ownership of an electric motorcycle over the life of it uh, should be significantly less than, uh, than an equal gas bike. And then is there any progress on the feet forward uh, streamliner prototype? Cedric's machine can now achieve 500 plus miles on a charge. Uh, currently, we've been working on the production bikes. We haven't been working um, as much on the fully enclosed streamliner, although we have, uh, we are continuing ongoing develop on, on streamlining our bikes. So um, we've, uh, taken the bikes, you know, to wind tunnels and clay and, and shape them to optimize their dynamics. We've done extensive uh, CFD testing to make, to increase the range. And, you know, part of what is attractive to us for land speed record setting is that's really about aerodynamics. So those lessons that we learn on the salt flats, on the dry lakes, um, even though the bike that we bring to market won't look the same, we can take what we learned there and bring that to our production bikes and to consumers. And then in person, your motorcycles look amazing. And I'm thankful that you showed me one of your models. I am interested in buying one in the future. You mentioned something about testing them in the facilities. Where would one sign up for that? Um, so we can be reached, you know, through our website and we can start that, uh, that, uh, conversation. And uh, so, yeah, the best place would be uh, lightningmotorcycle.com. And then any thoughts on a smaller version, electric sport bike, similar in size to a 300 CC or 600 CC? We, we are working on those currently. So those are some of the new products that, that we mentioned that uh, we'll be announcing. So uh, we have some some uh, collaboration in that area for smaller bikes, and we'll be making those announcements soon. Again, very exciting area. And then are you planning brick and mortar around in the major markets? Is that not too high cost? Would you instead introduce a new sales model, like an ambassador model, where select active bikers are brought on to participate in the local MC community uh, activities promoting lightning to traditional bikers and getting the bikes out there, not adding a high cost traditional sales channel. 
Yeah, I think the ambassador program has a lot of benefits and it's something that we are very interested in. Uh, you know, currently our main bottleneck is, you know, how quickly can we produce these bikes? It is really the, the focus of raising the money at net capital, um, making this offering for other people to, to get involved and help us take that money, invest in uh, at ramping up our production capabilities and then addressing uh, uh, the, the sales and distribution issues. And then how often is maintenance required? Do you expect maintenance or bike sales to drive most of the revenue? No, um, we we really look at bike sales as driving the, the majority of the, the revenue. The, the basic bikes themselves are, require significantly less you know, maintenance. We don't have oil changes. We don't have air filters. We're not, uh, no spark plugs, you know, clutches. So all of those kind of traditional maintenance items on a gas bike, um, electric bikes don't have, particularly ours don't have. So uh, there will be uh, less of that kind of maintenance revenue and uh, the bikes will uh, have a, an, an overall lower cost to uh, ownership for the, the purchasers. And then has development gone into charging system networks, i.e. if you if going on a road trip in order to recharge on your route or charge nearby? So right now, uh, level three chargers uh, are available uh, pretty much across the country. You can ride from the you know, northern border to the southern borders, uh, coast to coast. And, uh, you know, with just a little bit of planning, there should be uh, no issue in, in the majority of the country of finding level three chargers. And then, you know, level two chargers, any, any place you have uh, electricity, particularly if you have, you know, single phase 240, um, you can recharge the bike in, in, you know, relatively short amount of time and, and make that trip. But uh, again, people are riding coast to coast without any issues. And then do you see Lightning being the primary bike for riders or is it bike two or bike three? So what, what we found is, you know, uh, among our, our, our customers who buy a Lightning, very rapidly it becomes their main bike, even if they have a, a lot of other bikes. So just the, the overall experience of riding a Lightning compared to uh, gas bikes it seems to uh, switch people over and then... Uh, you know, a number of customers have sold their gas bikes and only ride their Lightnings. And then are there swappable batteries? Uh, not at this point. So we have been involved in swappable batteries on scooters. But once you have a bike that has, you know, more than 100 miles range, particularly 150 or greater miles, the... the uh, uh, the size of the battery, the weight of the battery really doesn't lend itself to, to swapping. And then uh, even if you did make uh, uh, a series of smaller batteries that could be swapped in and out, you add uh, a lot of weight and a lot of overhead to the vehicle, which I think overall is not as good a solution uh, as uh, the fast charging batteries. And, you know, that works pretty well for most people. And then can we help distribute your sales literature to outlets local to us? Absolutely. Yeah, contact us. We would uh, love to uh, to have you help us with that. And then how about special edition motorcycles and special colors and details? So, yeah, we do have, uh, particularly the 218, the 218s can be spec'd in uh, uh, pretty much any kind of house of, of color. Um, uh, that, that are available as well as different designs. Uh, the Strike, uh, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. That's, again, uh, more of a bike that's uh, targeted to, to bring it to market at a certain price. But, uh, you know, we, uh, we want to address and provide what customers need. So we're open to, uh, to, to discussing that. And then tire wear on EV cars is significantly higher than for ICE cars because of the high torque. And I imagine the same with the motorcycles. How do you keep sticky tires for safety yet durable for lifespan? You know, that's a, a, a user choice. 
right? So there are ICE cars, um, you know, that have very high torque and very high power that will have very short lives on, on tires as well as a very high power uh, electric car. So, um, you know, it, it's a choice that the uh, operator makes every time they open the, the throttle on how long their tires will, will last. So, you know, you can spec a harder tire, but uh, you'll have less traction and, and more tire spin. So, um, yeah, that's uh, basic physics and, uh, you know, third party vendors for tires as far as uh, how that how that will work out. I think you mentioned this earlier, but how long does a battery last? So it it depends on the cells. Uh, some of the the majority of the cells have. Um, uh, and again, we offer different cell choices for uh, different kind of use cases for bikes. Some of them are in the fifteen hundred to two thousand cycles before a twenty percent reduction in range occurs. So if that's 1,500 cycles and you have 150 miles, uh, that's 225,000 miles uh, before a 20% reduction. Uh, other uh, cells are in the you know 1,000 cycle range. And um, currently, if you are fast charging every cycle, that will reduce the cycle life. Um, and, and again, there are variables on that uh, as far as temperatures and, but uh, through, most people's use case, uh, in our opinion, uh, the batteries will last, uh, you know, longer than uh, um, than. But by the time you want to replace the batteries, there'll be better batteries available to uh, to replace them with. So, and then talking to a traditional HD sales management, they know nothing about electric bikes. Uh, trade in, they wholesale the trades, thus giving the seller a lower trade in value. Do you see any value in a training program for traditional dealerships and electric bikes so that the uh, used slash trade in market gets better appreciated? You know, definitely there's value in, in that type of uh, training program. And then uh, I think some kind of uh, secondary market support. Uh, could be useful as well. Um, and then I think uh, as, uh, as electric motorcycle adoption increases, uh, that secondary market will grow uh, organically and there'll be more of a demand for people. You know, particularly that, you know, the bikes can have such a long lifespan and, and uh, so few components wear out compared to a nice bike that uh, secondary market should continue to increase. I think one of the things that has limited the uh, uh, the secondary market value is the technology is still changing so quickly that when you look at a you know a five-year-old bike compared to a new uh, you know a, a current bike you know the range the performance the weight everything is uh, not on par and then how about a commercial on major sport events yeah uh you know we, we would love to do a, a Super Bowl ad. Um, you know, there's some great opportunities to get the word out. Uh, but currently our focus is investing in, uh, in ramping the production and addressing the demand that we currently have, trying to get bikes built and out sooner and, and have uh, bikes on hand where somebody can come in and just choose the one they want and ride off with it rather than uh, placing an order and, and waiting a, a couple of months. And then are you planning to launch a large model cruiser for cross-country cruising? Yeah, we're very interested in that. That's in the product roadmap. And then how about a special model for local law enforcement use? Yeah, also um, something that's, that's very interesting. So um, we can, uh, again, because we have a modular platform, that can be uh, developed fairly quickly. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the crowdfunding campaign. Why crowdfunding? Why'd you go the crowdfunding route and not through, you know, traditional like VC? So we we um, have had conversations with uh, with VCs. We pursued that. Um, so you know, in a way, we're kind of in a in a difficult uh, 
space in the business. So we're not a pure startup. You know, we're delivering product. It's out in the market. Um, a lot of VCs are looking for, you know, companies that are very early on. And then some of the VCs are looking for companies that are already scaling production. So we're kind of in that, that interim area. And, uh, you know, a lot of the VCs are interested in, in software. You know, hardware is not as much in favor with uh, the venture community in our experience. Uh, we, we are continuing to have uh, discussions with uh, venture investors as well as with um, legacy manufacturers. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, as we scale production, we've had a number of the, the kind of traditional venture firms that have said they're, they're interested in providing funding when we hit that that next production level. Uh, but uh, and, and I think that the whole idea of the democratization of uh, crowdfunding of equity, I think there's a real value there where uh, people can have access. You know, they they don't have. A, the level of money to do a venture investment, but they can still get that same benefit. So I, I think it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a great opportunity for everyone. And I just added the Lightning Motorcycles race page link. If you have any questions or want to learn more about their opportunity, there's the link for everyone. We have one more question here. Recognizing that you are scaling up your production capabilities, will you be providing your sales number to your investors? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, we will. Yes. Awesome. And then are you targeting any Euro markets in cities in Norway? 80% are EVs and there are charging stations all over the city. Are these markets more interesting than forcing the growth in the U.S.? Yeah, they, they are very interesting, but again, currently our limit isn't demand or limit is production so we're addressing that first and then we'll start to address those other markets and look at uh, international distributors and richard as we begin to wrap here is there anything you wanted to leave the um, the audience with today yeah so you know we appreciate everyone who's made the time to uh, to you know attend this this webinar uh, and learn a little bit more about what we're doing. Hope we've answered uh, questions of, that uh, people may have about where we are and where we're going. And uh, again, we think it's a, a very exciting time to be in the electric motorcycle industry. We think that it's uh, going to, uh, the volumes are going to increase and someone is, some electric motorcycle company is going to have that explosive growth in in production and value that we've seen with some of the electric car companies. And we think that we're very well positioned to be that company. And that's what we are uh, getting up early and working late to do. So again, thanks everyone for uh, uh, for attending and, and learning a little bit more about this. Yep. Thank you everyone who attended. The webinar has been recorded this whole time. So if you weren't able to attend, don't worry, we will be posting a recap on the Net Capital page. Have a good one, everyone. Go ahead.